and uh, welcome to this uh, RDS Vision 2030 series. Today we are looking at the business issues, the risks, the opportunities in this post-Brexit Ireland, riven by the devastation of COVID pa uh, pandemic. In Ju July of last year, when the UK and the EU were still locked in discussions to try and agree an exit trade deal, we had one of these uh, sessions. And at that session, our two experts today, uh, Ed Sweeney, Professor of Logistics at uh, Aston University in the UK and formerly Director of the National Institute of Transport and Logistics here in Ireland, and John McGrain, Director General of the British Irish Chamber of Commerce. Now with Brexit done, we've invited Ed and John back to discuss what has changed, what have we learned uh, from the experience of the past three months uh, when we've started the trade and cooperation agreement between the UK and the EU, and what does the future hold? So perhaps if we start off with you, John, um, may I throw you a question about the wide range of businesses, both here and in the UK, who are members of the uh, British Irish Chamber how have they managed so far under the Brexit agreement? And, uh, you know, the continuous sort of pushing out of the start date, we've seen it in Northern Ireland, we're seeing it now in the last few days with pushing out to, in fact, January 22 with some of the import. So what exactly um, can Irish uh, businesses look forward to and British businesses, you know, what's the dynamics that you see uh, going down and really, what are the uh, what is the way forward, shall we say? Thanks, John. Uh, I mean, the British Irish Chamber of Commerce represents businesses on both islands. We're the only organisation uh, missioned to grow trade, to champion the work of businesses and employers and investors in the two islands, uh, and to grow the jobs that come from all of that, that bring peace and prosperity across these islands and beyond. Uh, the reality is that, uh, yeah, we've got ourselves a Brexit deal, the Trade and Cooperation Agreement, and that's, that's to be highly welcomed. Many people predicted that we would not. I'm glad to say we felt that we would, uh, but also to acknowledge that uh, it's a pretty thin deal. Uh, it does get away, uh, move, do away with the idea of tariffs and quotas on inter-island trade in goods. Uh, it doesn't take care of other things like substantial documentation that will be as associated with that trade to show compliance, rules of origin and other things. Uh, and it's pretty patchy on services, uh, which is a major part of the joint economy and uh, provider of jobs on both islands. Um, also, you know, the overarching uh, environment in which businesses are operating at present isn't actually just about Brexit, it's actually about the world of COVID-19. And uh, the reality is that permeates every single facet of business life and civic life and community life. So, you know, businesses like ourselves are first and foremost thinking about the well-being of people who are impacted, the heroism of frontline workers, uh, and the sacrifices that so many people are making in communities, the length and breadth of these islands. Uh, but equally, uh, looking forward to the prospect of, you know, a successful inoculation campaign over the remaining part of this year on both islands, um, and a resumption, hopefully, of what can be then a jobs-led recovery, because that's the only recovery that's going to sustain. We need to get people back to work. We need to get people trading again. And... They will trade on the back of the trade and cooperation agreement, which, as I've said, is is good in parts. Uh, different people have different experiences of this. The reality is that um, the uh, the application of the rules, as you've as you've alluded to, is being done in a differential way. The European side, of which Ireland is part, is already uh, protecting its inbound imports into what is the single um, single market. Uh, the Northern Ireland dual status in that regard as between the two islands has already led to significant complications. They will get earned out, but it is complicated. And of course, GB, Great Britain, has not yet enforced its inbound uh, controls on imports of goods and has once again extended them even further out to 2021. That potentially masks a continuing lack of readiness, which is troublesome. Uh, and already net of all of that, a lot of businesses are remodeling their uh, international trading patterns, including using new sailing routes around, around England. Um, and changing uh, supply chain partners because of the complications of going through Britain in the ways that have been done in the past. So much changed, much still to come, uh, but business will find a way through this. 
Thank you, John. Uh, Ed, maybe if I could just uh, uh, come back to uh, you. And uh, when we last spoke, uh, we were talking about the potential disruption of Brexit. Um, and of course, we had COVID at that stage as well. Uh, so how do you see the, the transport, the shipping, the ports uh, managing uh, through this uh, early stage? Uh, we're only three months into uh, the trade uh, cooperation agreement. And we're we're getting kind of very mixed signals. The January figures out show a dramatic drop in the economy in the UK. Um, the UK exporters have lost 40% of their volume into the rest of Europe. So things aren't uh, coming across particularly well. But on the ground there in the UK, across the various supply chains, how are you seeing the um, the, the post Brexit uh, situation? Thanks, John. Uh, it's interesting, by way of um, preparation for this afternoon's session, I did take uh, a listen back to the recording of last July's session, and it's, it's, it's very interesting because we were speaking with a fair element of trepidation at that point about the prospect of no deal Brexit. So at least uh, we got a deal. Uh, I agree with John uh, that it was a thin deal. Uh, there's much that it doesn't do, but a, a constant refrain in my comments was really about uncertainty, the transition period, and we still did not know what was happening. So at least uh, the agreement uh, removes quite a lot of that uncertainty. Um, ju just to say, um, in answer to your specific question, John, we uh, what I see here in the UK is a very mixed picture, and I think that reflects a discussion that we had last July. We were talking last July about the level of preparedness uh, of transport companies, of logistics service providers, of infrastructure managers, and of companies generally across the supply chain. And the comment I made at that time was that I saw a very variable picture, and I think that mixed picture continues. Uh, to, a, to, to a fair extent. And we, we, you know, we certainly have lots of anecdotal evidence of significant variations uh, in terms of how companies have have, have a new normal uh, based on the sector. We see variations across companies in different sectors. We see, interestingly, variations in terms of how companies have coped across companies of different sizes, you know, and that was something we did uh, speculated last July. Um, if that's anecdotal evidence, the real evidence I, I, I think is beginning to emerge, John, as you said, in terms of the um, ONS uh, data that we've seen. Now, it's, it's, it's important that we don't read too much into just one month's data, but I think it is interesting to note that um, we see exports from the UK to the EU down by 40%. We see imports down by nearly 30%. At the same time, very interestingly, hidden amongst this data, we see trade um, with the uh, non-EU countries actually rising slightly. So um, that, that points to a big impact that Brexit has directly had in terms of these uh, trade flows. Um, as somebody who's originally from County Wexford, I, I've been following with great interest what's been happening in Rosslare uh, in particular. Uh, it's a very good example of the way in which companies have reimagined and re-engineered their supply chains to overcome some of the uncertainty that was inevitable uh, when uh, the uh, transition period came to an end, deal or no deal. And I'm, 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 ju I'm just looking at the um, data. Again, it's January, so let's be careful about, about this. But the port of Rosslare Your Port is, is, is telling us that it's seen a 45% increase in, in, in volumes going through the port in January, um, a big a, a big decline in terms of uh, flows to the UK, uh, but a massive increase, 400 odd percent increase in terms of direct trade to the UK. So the re-engineering of supply chains and the impact that's had and the way that's been facilitated by new trade routes uh, being opened up is, 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 is really interesting. I mean, m my last initial point I, I think really is about um, it was interesting to read Michael Gove's written statement to Parliament here in the UK yesterday, and, and what it really is acknowledging is, and I, I actually wrote down a direct quote from, from, from Michael Gove, he, he said that the government recognises the scale and significance of the challenges to companies here in the UK, and as a direct result of that, uh, some of the um, 
and some of the new uh, mechanisms of course have been pushed uh, pushed down the line uh, a little bit more so um i one comment i did make last time we spoke was a lot done and a lot more to do and i think in a sense we have done a lot but we're, we're continuing to learn a huge amount as this new reality uh, rolls out Ed, do you know the uh, free ports that uh, Boris mm -hmm. Johnson has uh, announced and putting a lot of uh, money into? Uh, will these free ports have an impact on Irish importers and exporters, the shipping uh, companies and, and the hauliers going back and forward uh, into the UK? Um, it's a good question. I don't know the answer to that question. Uh, what I'm trying to do at the moment is keep a watching brief on, on, on this, really, particularly in terms of how it affects... Um, trade flows between GB and and Ireland. Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, I must say that um, when the debate about free ports was happening, I, I, I was one who was a little bit sceptical about the role of, of free ports in terms of the wider supply chain landscape. We see evidence in other countries that it has the effect of sort of shifting things around a bit perhaps rather than necessarily stimulating new growth. Um, a lot of it is dri driven by the levelling up uh, agenda, inverted commas, here in the UK. Um, here in uh, the Midlands, where I'm based at the of the UK supply chain, we, we, we did, we, we were involved in very active discussions about, you know, is this something we should, is this a route we should go down? Uh, and um, I, I, I think it's really a watching brief. Let's wait and see what happens. Um, this will begin to get rolled out, I believe, towards the end of this year, and we will be in a better position to figure out what the implications might be then. Yeah. Uh, John, if I might just come back to you, um, and let's shift a little bit up uh, to the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, the, the unilateral uh, declaration by uh, the uh, UK of uh, uh, pushing out the date on that. And then, of course, the more recent one by Gove about pushing back certain food uh, import regulations into January of next year. And there's obviously a lot of political kind of concern going on. And uh, the EU are now threatening legal action against the UK. Are we in danger of the whole Brexit deal falling apart? Are we looking at potentially going back to... A, um, a hard Brexit? No. The reality is this is highly politically charged right now, of course, and uh, in some ways might have been predicted. I mean, the deal was written effectively on Christmas Eve and bus leaving businesses uh, with, you know, long established trading patterns and partnerships that ultimately served customers and families across Northern Ireland with really no time to prepare. And people like us might have been part of a process that said, look, get ready as long ago as four and a half years ago. But the reality is, as I've said before, smaller business in particular doesn't have the time, the money or the bandwidth to get ready for every possible eventuality. So really, they had to they had to mobilize very quickly around the actual imposition of quite disruptive new, uh, new procedures at ports and the like. Um, the reality is this will get worked out. Um, it won't get worked out by politicians shouting at each other or authorities on either the EU side or the UK side or any other side. Uh, it will only get worked out by people actually addressing what the operational disruptions are and actually coming up with the pragmatic ways to deal with those, which is always what happens in the end. And for us, we're very closely working with all of the parties involved. I gave evidence yesterday to the House of Commons Northern Ireland Committee on this to say that you know, the way forward uh, is about getting people around a table. And there is a table for this. It's called the Joint Committee in Northern Ireland. It didn't need anybody else to either not solve or attempt to unilaterally solve the problem. There's an infrastructure for the solving of this problem. And the Joint Committee uh, needs to be given the space with the parties behind closed doors to work out pragmatic arrangements. And equally, while, while we uh, are very much in favour of businesses calling out what the disruptions are, it's legitimate for the authorities on all sides to then say, OK, well, how long do you need to get ready because the answer isn't we don't want to get ready the answer is it's going to take time so in business we call those milestones you agree with me to do something and we agree what our milestones along the way should be to know that we're getting there and that we won't let ourselves down at the other end of that plan i think that's what needs to come into place now and i'm sure that will happen the reality is northern ireland now has you know rather than being in a problem situation it is in a phenomenally opportunist situation it is literally in the best of both worlds it can trade with unfettered access to the 65 million consumer uk market and it can trade with unfettered access for goods to the 
the 500 million consumer EU market. It is the only country in the world that has that opportunity in, in such a way. And I'm not being dismissive of the uh, pain and, and disruption that pervades right now, but that will pass. And we have to help businesses and communities throughout Northern Ireland begin to see the opportunity that lies ahead and to get other people, including businesses in GB and businesses in the Republic of Ireland, to invest in Northern Ireland, to support that community and to get the best of both worlds for their business. Uh, Ed, uh, you've seen Boris Johnson uh, uh, push uh, this uh, uh, tunnel studies, uh, funded a study, a major study on creating a tunnel between Scotland and Northern Ireland. Is that just a sop to the unionists or is that a genuine supply chain, you know, regional improvement uh, in your opinion? Um, I'm trying to use my words carefully, uh, John, um, referring back to um, the other John's comments about political bluster. Um, for as long as I can remember, we've had discussions uh, about, you know, some kind of link between Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, I, I think there are much more important um, issues around. Uh, I, I, I had a meeting this morning with um, some of our people in the business department here in the UK. Uh, there's an ongoing dialogue happening at, at, at country, le at nation level um, in, in the House of Commons, as well as around the nations and regions here in the Midlands. There's an ongoing dialogue happening, a very collaborative approach being adopted, for example, between uh, the West Midlands Combined Authority and the local mayor. Uh, and at local business and and I fully agree with what John said um, what we see in reality behind the scenes is a lot of pragmatic um, collaboration be be between policy makers uh, business and industry often facilitated by work we do in the university sector you will always get that political rhetoric I, I think often driven by electoral cycles but I, I mean, I think the reality is is that you know we're we're, we're beginning now here in terms of our our, our planning to think um, about the scenario that will unfold as the lockdown is loosened. Um, we 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 have here in the UK, as you have in Ireland, a kind of roadmap in terms of how things might look over the next couple of months. Uh, the Prime Minister here uh, is keen on telling us that it's about data and not dates. The data looks like it's moving in a positive direction. Uh, I think I mentioned to you earlier, I myself had my vaccination this morning. Uh, the rollout of the vaccination has been an incredible supply chain success and our logistics uh, profession uh, takes great credit for that. But I, I and, and many other good signs in terms of the data. So really our focus now is on uh, what is going to happen sort of in the immediate post uh, lockdown scenario because we're expecting we, we we can see massive pent up demand for a whole pile of different products and services and a lot of the work we're doing in supply chains is about saying how can we make sure now proactively in advance of the requirement that we're putting that supply chain capability into place and i think if there's one thing we've learned in the last 12 months it's that the supply chain profession uh, and supply in terms of how it's responded to a whole range of really challenging, once in a lifetime kind of challenges. So it's it's kind of looking forward with a degree of positivity and a degree of optimism uh, in terms of how can we make things work better when when we begin to move into a better space during the summertime and beyond. Thank you, uh, Ed. Last question, guys. Uh, uh, we have been looking at some of the figures um, and the UK economy has uh, started off poorly in the in the first few months. Uh, uh, but the OECD's report just out has indicated that it'll be growing very rapidly over the second half of the year and uh, for the next few years. In fact, one of the fastest growing economies uh, of the big scale internationally. Um, the I suppose the, the big issue is um, if you could put your Thinking cap on in terms of looking into the longer distance, the 2030 uh, picture, uh, what are the opportunities in terms of the Irish relationship there? There's obviously certain fractures because of Brexit, and there's obviously the uh, UK looking elsewhere. But it is our biggest market for so many of our SMEs, and they're their only market for many. So uh, your your view on, shall I say, the move towards uh, the next uh, back end of this decade 
uh, in terms of Irish UK relationships and what needs to be, let, maybe if we say which you read first what needs to be done in terms of making uh, the kind of the supply chains uh, you know the ease of trade continue uh, post Brexit I think um, the key to this will be about recognizing that we've learned a huge amount in the last 12 months. It's hard, it's hard to believe that it's 12 months really since we were talking about Wuhan, a city which nobody had, most people hadn't heard of before then. Um, but during that 12 month period, we've learned a huge amount about supply chains, what works and what doesn't work. And I think the really key thing is how we manage and capture that knowledge and build on it as we move um, into the future. I, I, I think it might, be that we have a window of opportunity, a post lockdown window of opportunity to really embed some of the good practices across supply chains generally. I'm thinking in particular some of the things we've learned about how to build structurally resilient supply chain architectures. I'm also thinking about um, the fundamental existential threat of climate change. We, I mean, we've learned people think that the sustainability agenda has sort of gone away somehow, it's been superseded by. COVID. I, I, I think um, reconfiguring our supply chains to make them more environmentally sustainable is going to be a key, key driver in the immediate term and in the long term. And we've actually learned a lot in the last 12 months about how we can make that happen, particularly in terms of the widely acknowledged fact, I think, that the deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions that we're looking for will be critically dependent on collaboration between companies up and down the supply chain. And we've become much better at that collaboration in the last 12 months. Um, I, I think uh, the relationships between these two islands are strong, fundamentally strong. Um, there, there's, there's a shared set of sort of values, there's, there's a shared set of economic interests. I think each of the two islands is critically dependent on the other. Um, the bonds are strong and I, I, I think they will always be, be, you know, elements of fragility put into them from time to time, usually as a result of political discourse. But I think the economic pragmatism and mutual dependence will win out over the political rhetoric in the end. Uh, John, your organization obviously is there to try and keep good relationships and boost business uh, between the two islands. And uh, with with Brexit, um, and we've seen the, the first uh, few months, and there's a lot of difficulties in the whole process. But if you just take the longer term view, uh, how would you see the relationships, the business relationships over the next decade? I'd echo what Professor Sweeney is talking about. We've first of all we've come through, please God, close to coming through um, the greatest challenge in mo in modern times, certainly in the lives of anybody still living, um, and um, you know we've we've learned a great deal about ourselves, uh, including we've learned a great deal about our interdependency. Uh, you know, whether in one city, in one country, and certainly in these two islands and beyond. Um, we're in the business of never wasting not one, but two crises. You know, the challenge that was laid before us by COVID-19 and the challenge that has been laid before us by Brexit, two pretty substantial uh, historic uh, events, no, no question about that. And uh, as I've said earlier on, business doesn't have any politics. It is pragmatic. It finds ways to serve customers in the most efficient ways. Uh, there are some challenges to the efficiency structures, but they will get worked out. And one of the reasons they get worked out is because all of us face some phenomenal further challenges to come. Ed has talked about climate. I mean, the only way forward in, in addressing you know, the path to net zero, barely you know, 30 years away, which is a phenomenal challenge, is by working collectively. Um, the, the birds and the bees don't know where the borders are. The wind and the waves don't know. The electrons don't know. So the reality is the only way for us to solve the grand challenge of decarbonizing the world is by working with our neighbors, including our nearest neighbors. And actually, an area where the UK is excelling at the minute is in its commitment to very ambitious targets for net zero and, and delivering on a number of those around things like offshore wind, where there's phenomenal investment already happening right now. And some of that is offshore Ireland, off the East Coast and ultimately off the West Coast. Those projects can be best done by working together by uh, in, uh, investors, so green finance, 
by regulatory environments being aligned, and by service providers and industrialists building projects, including with supply chain partners in both islands. And I could go further. I mean, areas like higher education and research that really are the key to powering up those who come after us and solving other grand challenges. Like, for instance, I sit on the Irish government's pensions commission. There's a challenge. The people like us who, who, who have you know, enjoyed a very satisfactory pensions regime around us for the last, you know, since the foundation of the Irish state, actually, certainly since the, since the 50s, um, have forgotten that actually the people coming after us won't be able to afford to pay for us in our retirement. So, you know, higher education, research communities, people thinking about these grand challenges, that's how we build a better future for everybody. And the best way to do that is to get researchers from both islands working together, where we already have a very good track record and where we should take, you know, guidance from the COVID challenge and the Brexit challenge and make sure that we enable our researchers to, to be part of one big shared community. And then lastly, in that regard, I mean, the reality is a huge amount of further things that we don't yet know are going to change. We have huge threats that we haven't addressed yet, like cyber, like, you know, the, the, the tech virus that, you know, to match the, the, the chemical virus that we've just seen. Um, but we also have, you know, new technologies coming along on the positive side that can help us to get to net zero. We need technologies that can transform the way we think about land and agriculture. And we have brilliant firms in the research space and the industrial space and investor space like Devonish, a truly Ireland and UK business led by uh, a fantastic team of people who are in it for the cause of transforming the way the world can be a more sustainable place by bringing science to the very basic use of land and animals. So uh, we, we, you couldn't be anything less than really, really hopeful for, a, for good times ahead if we do the right thing, which is, as we say in Irish, we're at our best when we work together. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your very useful, thoughtful, insightful commentary. Um, hopefully we will uh, get through this uh, pandemic and the Brexit uh, in good shape and that business will thrive over the next uh, decade. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, our two guests, Professor Ed Sweeney and Mr. John McGrain. Um, Many uh, of you who have tuned in, to, I'd like to advise you that the next Vision 2030 series webinar will be released on Friday, the April 2nd, when we will have uh, the founder and executive chairman of Mainstream Renewable Power, Dr. Eddie O'Connor, and he'll be in discussion with uh, journalist uh, Sean O'Rourke. Uh, this and other events can be accessed via the members area of the RDS website, and if you're not a member, the application forms are on site. Again, um, my thanks to uh, Ed Sweeney and John McGrain, and good afternoon to you all.